And um, we're getting near the end here of chapter 3, and uh, the title of tonight's sermon, Heirs of Promise, Heirs of Promise, Galatians 3, and it's verses 26 through 29, Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, and let's read that together, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. And the Bible says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we praise you, Lord, for the promise that we have in Christ. Praise you and thank you, God, that you have fulfilled uh, your promises in Christ, and that, Lord, by faith we can inherit those promises, that we can be fellow heirs with Christ. And what a glorious truth that is. So thank you, Lord, for this truth. Thank you uh, that you've given us that in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that even now as we study this passage, that you'd help us to apply that reality to our Christian lives so we can live lives by faith, uh, trusting in your promises, God, trusting in you. And Lord, that we look forward to uh, one day inheriting the promise, being with you forever in heaven. What a glorious time that will be. So thank you, Lord. You give us a great, great hope in Christ. And we thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we're uh, studying through Galatians. And now here, chapter 3, the end of the passage, the end of the chapter. And we're looking at heirs of promise, inheriting the promise through faith in Christ. And it's interesting how Galatians here in this passage is sort of dovetailing with what we've been studying on Sunday morning. Uh, we get really similar uh, teaching here, the book of Galatians and the book of Acts, especially in the, the area that we are in Acts and Acts 13, uh, follows really closely with what we're looking here uh, at Galatians 3. But so far in the book of Galatians, basically if you have to boil it down and you just want to sort of summarize what's going on so far, Paul is basically setting up the point that either righteousness comes as a gift from God or it, man earns it by his own merit. It's one of the two. Either the righteousness that you need to be right before God, that you need to, be, to have right standing with God, that you need to inherit heaven, that righteousness is either a gift of God or it's earned through man's merit, earned through law-keeping. And this entire time, he's setting up this contrast between law and faith. The promises that we know of God are received through faith. It is either going to be a view of works or it's going to be a view of faith. And that is the contrast that we see in world religion today. Christianity is the only religion that views the promises of God, views salvation, right standing with God, as being something that comes through faith and faith alone, as a grace of God, as a gift of God. Every other religion is through works by keeping the law, by being good, so to speak. And here, it's exactly what the point is through the book of Galatians. It's simply a contrast between either it is you gritting it out, you doing it, or it's God's grace. And there is no in-between, and there's no mixing of the two. You can't set this up, as the Catholics do, as being faith and works equal salvation. It just simply doesn't work that way. It's either faith alone or it isn't. Um, faith alone means by default that it can have nothing to do with your works. And hopefully through the book of Galatians, that's becoming more and more clear. If it's of faith, it simply can't be by works. Now, in this contrast between law and faith, Paul uses the example basically of, of Abraham. He tells Abraham before the cross, look, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to send you a redeemer. I'm going to send you a savior. And he says to Abraham, do you believe me? And Abraham says, yes. And God says, you're righteous. <laughs> right? I mean, that's basically the way this works. It, it sounds simple, but that's it. He sets up Abraham. He tells Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. The Bible says Abraham believes him, and God says, you believe me? Abraham says, yes. You're righteous. Now, that comes by a sovereign gift of Almighty God. That biblical belief, that understanding that Abraham had, came as a gift from God. Faith 
and grace is a gift of God, and it's given by gift, and it's supernatural. It's not a simple understanding of the gospel, a natural understanding. The Bible says the natural man does not receive the things of God, nor is he able because they're spiritually discerned. But that's it. Faith is Abraham believing. Now, by the flip side of that, God to us said, I have sent a Savior. Abraham looks forward to the cross, expecting the Redeemer based on the promises of God. We today, we look back at the cross, understanding that God has sent the Savior. And so he says to you and I, do you believe? (laughs) Do you believe that I've sent a Savior? We, biblically, say, yes, you're righteous. And if you're righteous, if you biblically believe, you exercise saving faith in Christ, then based on that belief, God says that you're righteous. That belief comes with repentance. They are flip flip sides of the same coin. You can't have biblical faith without repenting of sin. That belief comes with a, a heart and mind and soul supernatural understanding of the gospel that comes by gift of God. But it is that. He says, I've sent a redeemer. Do you believe me that you'll be saved? Do you believe me that I'll save you through the finished work of Christ? Do you believe me that I'll save you through faith in Christ? We say, yes, Lord, we believe. That belief results in trust, commitment, following Christ. And then in doing that, God says, you're righteous. It is strictly by faith alone, nothing to do with works. See, if you see it that way, then you look back on the cross of Christ, you look back at the finished work of Christ, you look back at God's sacrifice You look back at God's provision of a Savior, and God merely says, do you believe me? And if you believe with the faith of Abraham, then it is credited to you as righteousness. You are righteous in God's eyes. You're in Christ, and he sees you that way, and it is just that straightforward. And if it's that, then it can't be of works. Basically, it comes down, you've got to ask yourself the question, what could you possibly add? What would you possibly add? If you're in Christ now, you've repented of your sins, you put your faith in Christ, and you're trying to live the Christian life, and you are trying to, as we've already discussed, rebuild that which has been torn down, trying to rebuild right standing with God through works of the law, think about it for a second. What would you add to the finished work of Christ in order to be saved? You can't, there's nothing, right? I mean, the finished work of Christ is perfect. If you're here, maybe you're not converted. You're not saved. You want Christ. You want heaven. You want eternal life. And you think to yourself, well, man, I just got to do this and I've got to do that. I've got to study my Bible more. I need to pray more fervently. I need to evangelize more fervently. I've got to be at church more fervently. I mean, what can you possibly add to the finished work of Christ. So because it's of faith, it simply cannot be of your works. Those two things are mutually exclusive. Now, once you have Christ, once you've inherited the promise, the title to the Sermon of the Night is Heirs of Promise. Once you have that promise and you've laid hold of that by faith in Christ, then what does that mean? What does it look like? And we're going to see that tonight. Basically, verses 26 through 29 is what does a Christian look like? What is a Christian? We've already talked about the the contrast between law and faith, what it means to go back and look at law, what it means to err in trying to establish right standing with God by the law, and what it means to be saved by faith. Now that we know what it means to be genuinely saved through faith in Christ, what does that look like? And we're going to see that in 26 through 29. In these verses, you're going to see it's not under law, you're in Christ. You're not under law, you're under grace. You're not under bondage, you've been set free. You're free from condemnation, free from judgment, free from the law, free from the penalty and power of sin. You're free in Christ. You're not any longer under a tutor or a paedagogos. I don't know that we got there the last time we were looking at Galatians 3, but in the section just before this, um, he's talking about the law, it says in verse 24, was our tutor. That word there is paedagogos. It's a a, a master, a disciplinarian. When kids were kids back at this time, they were given a tutor, someone who basically ruled over them. They taught them, but they had the power of the rod. And so when they got out of line, 
They beat them with the rod. They were a tutor. They were a disciplinarian. That's the way Paul here is describing the law. They were under this disciplinarian, the law, and the law would smack you with the rod when you got out of line. But now you're no longer under that tutor. You are free from that tutor in Christ. You're no longer under law. Um, now you're in Christ. Let me ask you a question. And this is a question we've asked before. We've talked about this before. You've got to continuously let this sink in. Are you still trying to live your Christian life under the tutor? Are you still living your Christian life in such a way that, I mean, if you're genuinely Christian, this is a, there's a fine line here. If you're genuinely saved by God, then this life that you live in the flesh is lived by faith in the Son of God. Galatians 2.20, we talked about it this morning. You live your life by faith in Christ, and by faith in Christ, you have the victory over sin, and you'll see progress. If you are sanctified, you're being sanctified. It's good assurance that you're genuinely saved. If you're not being sanctified, you can rest assured that you're not saved. Sanctification comes with salvation. But in this Christian life, if you are a genuine disciple, you can't go back and live your life like you were under the tutor, where every time you step out of line, you get the rod. There is no faith exercised in living the Christian life that way. Victory is not going to come by gritting it out in your own power under the law, living as if you were under a tutor. And every time you step out of line, you're getting whacked with the rod. Now that should not and cannot encourage you if you're falsely converted. Or it cannot encourage you if you're not genuinely saved and you're just an external conformer. You need to come to faith in Christ. That message there, that power of faith in the life of a Christian, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, that belongs to a Christian. It doesn't belong to you if you're not a Christian. So if you're living the Christian life, you've repented of your sins, you're following Christ, then that victory is going to come through faith. You can't live your Christian life under the tutor any longer. Now that doesn't mean that we throw the law of God out the window. The moral law of God still applies to the Christian. We have to live according to that moral law of God. We're commanded to keep those commandments. But that victory, the keeping of those commandments, is by faith in Christ. When you stand before God, and now by faith in Christ, you're doing good works. You're living a life that is pleasing to God because you're keeping his commandments in faith. When you stand before God, God doesn't look at you and say, wow, look at all the good things that you've done. God looks at you, and because of your union and identification with Christ, he sees Christ, and he sees the work of his Spirit in your life, and to the praise of the glory of his grace, you are right before him. Nothing to do of you. <laughs> Nothing to do with you. It's not your good anything that secures right standing with God. It is all of his grace, all of Christ, all of faith. And so with this, it's not that as a disciple that you can grit it out in your own power. Anything that is not done in faith is sin. The life that you live must be lived in, by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for you. So this is all through faith. Now, adding any works to faith, we've already seen through the book of Galatians, is like the Judaizers, what the Judaizers are doing here. It's the sin of the Judaizers. When you as a disciple go back to live under the tutor, you're committing this sin of the Judaizers. You're trying to establish right standing with God based on your merit, and you simply can't do it. In their case, they were adding circumcision, adding law-keeping to faith. That's what we've been going through here in the book of Galatians. Think about that for your life. What are you trying to add to faith in order to be right with God? The answer to that should be nothing if you're a disciple. You've got to get that out of your life. Here in verses 26 through 29, we're going to see several, in these verses, several points of what a Christian look like, looks like and how this life of faith applies. If you're in Christ here, then we're going to see that you are sons through faith, you're baptized into Christ, you're clothed with him, you're one in him, and you are heirs with him of the promise. The main point here that Paul's going to set up in Galatians 3, these verses, are that disciples of Christ are the offspring of Abraham by default, by virtue of their union with Christ through faith. 
Well, who are the true sons of Abraham? Who are the true daughters of Abraham? True sons and daughters of Abraham, those of the faith of Abraham, are those that, by virtue of their union with Christ, have exercised genuine saving faith in Christ. Those are the sons of Abraham. Those are the ones that are going to inherit the promises. And this is not, you have to understand, not just following some man's teaching. When the Bible talks about being in Christ, baptized in Christ, clothed with Christ, identified with him, in union with him, that's far different than just following some guy's teaching, right? You don't hear Muslims talk about being in Muhammad, Ugh, right? In Buddha. It's not something you find in world religions. This is only, this is true. This is the only truth, the exclusive truth, and this means in Christ. You're identified with him. You are baptized into him, baptized into his death, baptized into his resurrection. This is a glorious thing. This is not just some other world religion. Uh, this is the true faith. So let's talk about this. We're going to start off now with verse 26. And the first point that I want you to see from verse 26 is that you are sons of God through faith. Look at verse 26. For you all, it's pretty clear here, right? For you all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this does not mean, and what he's saying here is not that we are all children of God. Right? You've heard that before? Witness to people before? We're all God's children. Yeah, no, we are not. And Scripture is very clear about that. Jesus said to the Jews in John 8, 44, that they were of their father, the devil. Ephesians 2, 3 says of those that are sinners outside of Christ that they are children of wrath. Ephesians 5, 6 calls them sons of disobedience. Romans 5, 10 says that they are enemies of God. 1 John 3, 8 says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3.10, just a couple of verses later. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So we are not all children of God. You are a child of God by faith in Christ. You're a child of God by being the spiritual seed of Abraham. The seed, now we've talked about that before, that Paul sets up his argument for faith in Christ through the promise, according to his seed, singular, that is Christ. The, the seed of Abraham is Christ. The inheritor through the faith of Abraham, the fulfillment of the promise, is Christ. And if we are in Christ, then we're the spiritual seed of Abraham. And so the seed there pertains to Christ. We're not all sons of God. All here simply refers to that believers come from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. There is no partiality. There is no discrimination. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, all sons there. Now, there are a couple of examples of that in Scripture. One is John 1.12. He came to his own. His own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. All right, that's one example. Look at Romans 8. Let's look at another example. Romans 8. And look down, starting in verse 12. This is Romans 8, 12. Speaking of sons of God. And this, is, this in and of itself is an awesome truth. To be considered a son of God, a child of God, adopted into his family. As we get into some of these other verses in uh, Galatians chapter 4, we're going to talk about adoption. There's a glorious doctrine in Scripture, the doctrine of adoption. And we're going to be able to look at that over the next couple of weeks. But here in John 8, starting in verse 12, or I'm sorry, Romans 8, verse 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, right off the bat, if you're a son of God, a child of God, you get the Spirit of God. And that is an awesome promise. It is impossible to please Him, impossible to live for Him, impossible to be a Christian without the Spirit of God. It's a glorious blessing. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So one characteristic of being a son of God is that you're led by the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit, and you're led by the Spirit. You're walking according to the Spirit, right? Verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now that's your spirit witnessing with his spirit. It's a, the Lord working and teaching through his word. You understand truth from his word and your spirit is like, amen. And I want to follow Christ. It just charges you up. That's your spirit witnessing with his spirit that you're a child of God. My sheep hear my voice. You're not going to sit in a Mormon temple or a Jehovah's Witness or some Catholic service and hear some wicked Catholic theology about work salvation and say, amen, I want to go out and work and grit and bear it and do more works. It's not going to happen. My sheep hear my voice. You're going to hear the truth of God. And if you are of Christ, if you have the spirit of God, then your spirit witnesses with his spirit that you're a child of God. And that happens by his spirit through his word. Um, look at uh, the end of that uh, chapter. And if children, verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. It's an awesome thought to be a child of God that you're going to suffer with him. But if you suffer with him, you'll also be glorified with him. That's an awesome thought too. One day glorified uh, in heaven forever with Christ. Another example of this is in Hebrews 2. This is awesome too. I love this passage of scripture. Hebrews 2. Same kind of concept here. Hebrews 2. And look at this. Verse 10, Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. It was fitting for him to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. That's an awesome thought. Saying, verse 12, I'll declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I'll sing praise to you. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, here I am in the children whom God has given me. Verse 14, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. No longer in bondage, you're in Christ. Amen? For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That propitiation there is a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. He satisfies the wrath penalty of God. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. It's not a shame to call us brethren. When you're in Christ, you're a son of God, a child of God, we have Christ, and Christ is not a shame to call us brethren. So that's verse 26. But now look at verse, back in, um, in Galatians 3, look at verse 27. And the next point on your notes here is that you are in Christ through faith. Point one, you're sons of God through faith. Point two, you're in Christ through faith. And verse 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, before you were baptized into Christ, you were clothed in old Adam, right? And you know the difference. If you've been genuinely converted, you were once clothed in Adam. When you come to Christ, you're clothed in Christ. I mean, when the Bible says examine yourself, whether you're in the faith, that shouldn't take you a long time to come to that determination. You're either going to be clothed in Adam or you're clothed in Christ. And there is a, a big difference. Unless you have just completely deceived yourself, you got yourself so caught up that, yes, I'm in Christ, and your life just simply doesn't match up and you don't see it. Or otherwise, it's very clear. When you come to Christ, you're putting on the new man. You, become, you start looking like Christ. Uh, your life starts to become identified with Christ. We'll see that in a moment. Now here in verse 27, what he's not talking about is he's not talking about water baptism, okay? Especially in the letter to the Galatians, he's not saying that water baptism is necessary for salvation. He's not talking about that. And if you think about it, here's a good 
example or a way to think about it, especially if you're talking to someone that's coming out of the Church of Christ movement or something like that, someone that teaches baptismal regeneration, Catholicism again, is that here we've got the Judaizers who are trying to add works of the law to salvation. They're trying to add circumcision to salvation. Now, we've got two covenants at play here that are sort of in transition, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What was the sign of the Old Covenant? Circumcision, right? Circumcision was the sign of the Old Covenant. Here, Paul is saying that if you try to add the sign of the Old Covenant to salvation, which has been the same from eternity past to eternity future, all through faith in Christ, if you tried to add the sign of the Old Covenant to salvation, you're to be accursed. If anyone comes to you preaching any other gospel, even if we or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel to you, which is really not another, that person is to be accursed, right? But now what is the sign or symbol of the new covenant? Baptism. Baptism. Certainly, if you can't add the sign of the old covenant to salvation, well, the last place you're going to teach that you're going to add the new sign of the covenant, the new symbol of the new covenant to salvation is going to be the book of Galatians. In the same way that you're anathema for adding circumcision to salvation, the sign of the old covenant, you are anathema for adding the symbol or sign of the new covenant to salvation. It is always and only by faith alone in Christ alone. And so here it's certainly not talking about water baptism. It, it cannot be. Faith appropriates, your faith in Christ appropriates what baptism symbolizes. Baptism symbolizes your death and burial with Christ, uh, rising to walk in newness of life. These are simply just initiation rites, and they're important. Baptism is so important that oftentimes in Scripture, you see it closely associated with conversion because it's something that God says you're going to do if you're genuinely saved. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Repent and be baptized, all of you, for the remission of your sins. He's not saying be baptized so that you can have your sins forgiven. Baptism is a closely related symbol of an inward reality. But here, it's not teaching salvation by water baptism. We want to make that clear. And you'll get folks that will use this passage of Scripture to argue for that. Uh, here, what it's referring to is identification with Christ. And another parallel passage of this is Romans 6. Look at Romans 6 for a second. It's just identification with Christ. In Romans 6, and look at verse 3. The key word here is ace, into. It's into. Romans 6, 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, immersed into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together, that's identification with Christ, in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's one place. Look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2. What he's referring to here in Galatians 3 is just identification with Christ. In Colossians 2, look down at verse 11. And this is interesting, this parallel with circumcision here. Colossians 2, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Right? It's not flesh circumcision. That's the circumcision made without hands, circumcision of your heart. By putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven, all your, forgiven you all trespasses. That's awesome. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, I heard that said multiple times, used multiple times to say, listen, you don't have to keep the moral law of God. You don't even have to try. He has taken that thing out of the way and nailed it to the cross. That is a misunderstanding of this passage of Scripture. You are no longer under law as a system for salvation any longer. You are under grace. It's not that you're going to, in Adam, strive to keep the law and have to keep the law perfectly in order to be right with God. You can't do it. 
You're no longer, no longer under law, under the condemnation of the law. Now you're over here under grace. By grace you've been saved through faith. And so that's not saying that you can just abandon obedience to God's commands. Uh, if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, then you have been clothed in Christ. You've been baptized into Christ. Now you're identified with him. And in your identification with Christ, you are dead to sin. And you can sin no longer. How can we who have died to sin live any longer in it, Paul asks. And so you, you're going to start looking like Jesus Christ. You're going to be sanctified. You're going to be purified. You're going to have your sin. You're going to have victory over sin, okay? This clothes with Christ, this baptism in Christ, this is the way this works, identification with Christ. When God sees the sinful believer, he sees his sinless son. He sees you so closely associated with Christ that he doesn't see the sin of the believer in that sense. He sees his sinless son and you identified with him. You become clothed with Christ. But then clothed with Christ, you start putting on the new man. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that comparison there, that analogy to being clothed in Christ? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, you cannot be clothed with Christ and make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. When you put on Christ, you put on the new man, you're clothed in Christ, baptized into Christ, you don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You strive to get rid of that thing. You strive to get rid of sin. Philippians 2, 14 says, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now here's another part of being closed with Christ. Verse 16 says, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So once you are clothed in Christ, you're never going to be naked again. <laughs> once you're clothed in Christ, you hold fast the word of life. You persevere in the faith. Once clothed in Christ, there's no turning back. You are now transferred into the kingdom of his dear son, a son of God, adopted into his family, and there simply is no going back. And you wouldn't want to, right? There's no going back. You're following Christ. Uh, you'll never be naked again. But now go back to um, Galatians 3. And point 3 I want you to see from this is that you are one in Christ now through faith. So back in Galatians 3, and look at verse 28. Verse 28. Now, verse 26, you're all sons of God through faith. Verse 27, you were baptized into Christ. You've put on Christ. You are in Christ through faith. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So you're all one in Christ through faith. Now, here it's interesting to see, he's not calling them to be all one. He's not saying you are to be all one. He says you are all one. Right? And then in Ephesians 4, when he commands Christians to labor to maintain unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, you're to maintain what's already true. <laughs> you're to maintain what's already been given. If you're in Christ, you're all one in Christ because he says that we are. Uh, but there's always something, and this is a constant problem, there's always something in our flesh that prompts us to want to be superior to someone else. There's just something wicked in our flesh, in our members, that strives for that. You have to fight against it. Here, what he's saying is that there's no ethnicity, there's no social class, there's no gender discrimination at all. Those three things, ethnicity, social class, and gender, are completely irrelevant in determining who is and who isn't a child of God, who is or isn't a true son or daughter of Abraham. They're simply irrelevant. There's to be no discrimination. Those walls of separation are completely broken down. We've been talking about this through the book of Acts, and we saw that example of Peter with Cornelius. And he says, after the vision, I can truly see there is no partiality with God, right? There's to be no discrimination. 
um, those discriminations, that wall has been broken down completely. We see that with the leaders in Acts 13, just a couple of weeks ago, when we looked at the diversity of leadership in the church in Antioch, and just the, the, the class, uh, the, the social status, the ethnic, ethnicity, those were all things that were completely out of the way. There's simply no more, um, no more partiality, no more discrimination there. Uh, a good example of this is Philemon, and Philemon and his slave Onesimus, and how he was to be treated, and how Paul wrote to him. It's just a good example of this in Scripture. Um, turn to James 2, and let's look at this a little more closely. James 2, Hebrews, James. And look at James 2, starting in verse 1. James 2, 1. And he says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see that right off the bat. You show partiality, you become a judge with evil thoughts. Even in making the distinction which is in generating the partiality, making that distinction makes you a judge with evil thoughts. Uh, that's wickedness. Verse 5, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There simply is to be no partiality. But now why is this important? Turn to Ephesians 4. Why is this important? And what's the point here? Ephesians 4, look in verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see that? We need to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And here is why. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We are all one body. This is important. There can be no partiality. Now, there is no discrimination, but Scripture holds up distinctions. Um, that's in the Trinity itself, right? There's equality in the Trinity, but there is functional subordination. There are differences in roles. The same thing holds true for your marriage. You and your spouse are functionally equal in God's eyes, spiritually equal, functionally distinct in your roles. God gives you different roles to fulfill. Now, in our society, we have a problem with that. That strips gears in people's heads. How can you be equal but different? Right? That's an, a problem. But listen, you as a believer, as a disciple in Christ, can't let worldly reason, reasoning infect your thought process here. This is what Scripture teaches. You are equal and you are different. God says there's to be no discrimination, no partiality, but he upholds distinctions. Now, he does it in, in many ways. One, the roles that you perform in your marriage. That's a good example. Husbands are to be the head of the wife. Wives are to submit to their husbands. God establishes that in the marriage. God establishes authority, establishes authority in the church. God establishes functional differences according to role, and we just have to get used to that. Um, you can't let worldly reasoning infect that. You have to submit in those kinds of things to what Scripture says rather than limiting Scripture to your own understanding of it. You just have to accept what Scripture says, but that's what it says. Uh, we're equal but different. There are role uh, distinctions that are set up here. Now, this also, I want to make clear, is not advocating some social agenda. This is not teaching um, evangelical women's lib, 
It's, it's, people will use this passage of Scripture to support that. This is not what this is teaching. There are many that think that, okay, well now this passage completely opens it up so that there can be women pastors, you know, women leaders in the church. It, they believe that that's what it teaches. It teaches evangelical women's lib. This is not teaching uh, liberation theology. You see that the, the poor and oppressed, uh, it's just simply not teaching that authority, but, or uh, that theology, but a lot of folks twist it to mean that. It simply means that we are equal spiritually in Christ. We're one body, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. We're all of one. You're one in Christ Jesus uh, through faith. And we're not to show uh, partiality. Now, this is exemplified well in the New Testament through fellowship. When we're looking through Acts and studying through those sections of Scripture, where as soon as that wall of separation came down, they started fellowshipping together. They started eating together. They were in a Gentile's house, eating Gentile food, fellowshipping with Gentiles. That's what that means. There's to be unity, warm Christian fellowship, and that's exemplified in Scripture by sharing a table together, breaking bread together. Uh, there's to be that kind of fellowship, that kind of love. John 13, 34 and 35, uh, the Bible says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. If you're showing partiality, if you're discriminating, and praise the Lord, we don't see that in this church. Uh, we just don't see it. This church is a diverse, loving body of believers, and I'm so grateful to God for that. It's just an awesome blessing. Uh, it's a great blessing. It's a rare thing these days. Even now, it's, can you believe it? Even now, that's a rare thing. As far as we think we've come uh, in church, they call church the most segregated time of the week, Sunday morning. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's, just, there's not to be that. And when you show partiality, that sin, we are to demonstrate our love for one another by not doing that. Uh, if you show partiality, you're not loving, you're hating your brother. There's to be no partiality. Uh, by this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Somebody comes in here, that's often said. It's a common statement that, wow, this looks like a, a genuine Bible-believing church because look at the diversity in this place. That's an awesome blessing. And we love our brothers. We love our sisters. All right? Um, this is important because God has established authority, and so it's important to make that distinction. We are equal in Christ, but functionally different in roles, and we have to maintain that. But that also doesn't eliminate giftedness. That's seen in the gifts that God gives some men are gifted, some ladies are gifted in one way, other men, other ladies are gifted in another way. God distributes gifts to each as the body has need. Some, some are a hand, some are a foot, right? Some are a belly button, <laughs> some are a right ear, some are a left ear. God gives gifts based on the needs of the body, and that should give us great joy to implement our gifts according to the need of the body, right? If, if if God gives you a gift, that's God's gift to you. I mean, that's, you should cherish that. You should implement that in service to God's body, in service to the church, uh, for the benefit of your brother, uh, to see souls saved, uh, for the furtherance of his kingdom. That should give you great joy. God gifted you in that way. But to, again, going back to this issue of showing partiality, if you are jealous or envious of your brother for a gift your brother has, Again, that's showing partiality. That's discriminating. That's not loving your brother. That's not the spirit that we should have. That's sin. Uh, we're not to be that way. God grants gifts, and it's God who is the gift giver. It's God that is the originator and the source of the gift. And so one person gifted in one way, another person gifted in another way, praise be to God. And there's just no partiality. Uh, it's just no partiality. Uh, it all comes from God. The person that has that gift, if they're in Christ, in no way should be boastful about that. Is it uh, 1 Corinthians 4 that says you act as if though you've received nothing, but everything you have you've received. So why do you boast? Why would you boast in that? That is the grace of God. It's the mercy of God. It's, and as soon as God gives it, God can take it away and turn your pride on your head. Uh, you can't be that way. But now, the truth of the matter is, is that God establishes giftedness in the church. And so you're to establish and use your gifts. And those that are serving in the church should serve according to their giftedness and not overreach that. 
serve according to your giftedness, and that's what's important. All right, but now point three on your notes, back in Galatians. Point three, in verse 29, we are heirs of the promise through faith. Now we've seen we are sons through faith, we're in Christ through faith, we're all one in Christ through faith, but here in point three, we're heirs of promise through faith. And that's in verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now this is a glorious truth. We praise God for it. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs. If you're a child of God, a son of God, then you are an heir. An heir of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Look at Romans 4. Romans 4, and let's take another look at this. Romans 4. And look down beginning in verse 13. Romans 4, down in 13. Now this promise is awesome. We talked about it this morning, uh, that you are, you inherit the promise, you are heirs of the promise through faith in Christ. And look at Romans 4, down in verse 13. For the promise that he would be an heir of the world was not to Abraham or to, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The righteousness of Christ imputed to you, given to you, credited to you through faith, through genuine saving faith. Verse 14, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the, the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, verse 16, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure. And we looked at this this morning that in order for the promise to be steadfast, sure, uh, it had to be based in God, in Christ alone. Otherwise, if it's based in you, it's not sure. But it, it had to be of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written... I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now that, according to what was spoken, that's the promise of God. God promises Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And in hope, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and in his faith became an heir of the promise. God makes the promise. Abraham exercises faith in God because of the promise, and as a result of that, he inherits the promise. He gets the promise. And that's true of you. It's true of me today. God makes a promise. He says there's salvation. And there's salvation in no other. There's only one name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved. That's the man Christ Jesus. If you have faith in Christ Jesus, if you turn from your sin, put your faith in Christ, then you can have the righteousness that is the, re the requirement of my justice the righteousness that you need to be right with me. And being right with God means eternal life, forgiveness of sins. It means Christ in heaven forever. It's the promise that God has given. And that's all done through faith. God gives the promise. You savingly believe the promise. And you can't add anything to that. When you savingly believe the promise, you inherit the promise you become an heir of Christ, a child of God, a joint heir with Christ, inheriting the promise. It's just a really simple formula, right? Just really the way that that works. God makes the promise. You believingly, you savingly believe the promise. You inherit the promise. And that's all through repentant faith in Christ. And it's important to understand that that faith, we've talked about this last week at Living Faith Conference, is not just simple belief. It's just not counting something as true, holding something to be true. This is God-gifted saving faith, that God applies the understanding of the Scripture to your mind, works that into your heart, activates your will, and you become savingly 
believing in the promise. You become someone who lives for Christ, committed to Christ. You become a new creation, a new nature. And that inheritance only comes through faith in Christ. I saw this quote. It was interesting. And it sort of sums up what's going on here in the book of Galatians. And the quote goes like this. We cannot come to Christ to be justified. And that, means, that means made right with God. We cannot come to Christ to be justified until we have first been to Moses to be condemned. But once we have gone to Moses and acknowledged our sin, guilt, and condemnation, we must not stay there. We must let Moses send us to Christ. That's the issue. You can't be justified until you go to Moses to get condemned. And when you're condemned by Moses and you acknowledge your sin, guilt, and condemnation, you can't stay there. If you're a disciple of Christ and you're clinging to the promises of God by faith, and you're clinging to hope in Christ for victory over sin, to live the Christian life. You're clinging to Christ for hope of eternal salvation, a clear conscience, forgiveness. And you're doing all that by faith in God. You can't stay with Moses. Moses has to. You can't stay there. You can't live the Christian life there. You can't walk in the Spirit there. You can't be there. You have to let Moses send you to Christ. And you abandon that to live wholeheartedly for Christ. And in Christ, faith has the victory over sin. You have God's Spirit indwelling you to give you the power to live the Christian life. It only comes through faith in Christ. When you come to faith in Christ that way, you inherit the promise of God, and it's an awesome inheritance, right? It only happens by faith. This passage here is setting up that contrast. It's a summary of, to what has gone on before. And now, finally, at the end of chapter 3, we see what a genuine Christian now looks like. This contrast of law and faith. And now here, what does a Christian look like? You are all sons of God. You're all one in Christ. You're in Christ and you're heirs of the promise. All of that through faith. And then now in chapter 4, if you're an heir and you're a child, then we're going to look at adoption and what it means to be in the family of God, what it means to have God as your father. The access that you have to the father by faith is an awesome and glorious thing in the Christian life. It's that access to the father by faith in Christ that gives you the power to live the Christian life. And we're going to talk about that more next week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, uh, thank you for this great salvation. I'm just constantly, Lord, in awe of it, uh, just constantly Lord, seeing just how multifaceted it is and how awesome it is, Lord, and how gracious and merciful you are uh, in providing this for us through your Son and through his work on the cross, Lord. And just thank you, Lord, for this. And I pray, God, as we continue to work through the book of Galatians, Lord, this letter, uh, that you would help us to see just the utter futility of the law to inherit the promise, the law, to do anything to please you, Lord, but that it must be done through faith in Christ. And Lord, help us to, to understand that faith, Lord, to grasp it uh, in all its depth, in all its richness, apply that to our hearts so that we can live victoriously in Christ, uh, overcome sin. Uh, we know, Lord God, that we are, even as Christians, Lord, even as disciples of Christ, that we, we, God, we want to obey your law. We want to live by your commandments. We want to live wholeheartedly for you. And you've said in your word, he who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And we know that, Lord. We know that obedience to your commands is a fruit, is an evidence of genuine saving faith. And so, Lord, we know also that that comes through faith in Christ and how important it is, Lord, that we walk according to faith, uh, walk according to your spirit, live according to your spirit, putting to death the deeds of the body. Help us to do that, Lord. We just see in this letter uh, great promise, great hope, great strength, Lord, in the faith that you have provided through Christ. So help us to live that life. Lord, we want to be pleasing to you. You are our Lord, our God. And we are so thankful, Lord, to be children, sons of God by faith in Christ, heirs of the promise. Just what an awesome thought. So thank you, Lord. We love you and just...
take great joy in seeing you exalted, seeing Christ magnified, uh, seeing your gifted grace and faith being lifted up. Lord, it's just a, a glorious thing in our sight. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for these brothers and sisters, and thank you for our fellowship together, Lord, and this oneness that you have given us. Uh, Lord, this unity, this peace, uh, it is a wonderful thing, and we just thank you for that blessing. All these things we pray in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.